Hello, everybody. I'm very excited today. And today as well, we have an amazing guest. Uh, I met uh, Coach Les Evans in, in 2014, and my, I was totally blown away. I mean, he, the content, everything he taught me totally transformed my life. And I'm, I'm, I'm grateful. Whenever I see everything that he's doing for other people, I really appreciate that. And I'm very excited today because everybody, we're all going to be learning from, from the maestro himself. And uh, Coach, good morning. <laughs> yes, good, good morning and good evening to you there. So, Yes, yes. How's Canada this morning? Uh, it's a little chilly. We just got some snow uh, last night, so it's a little chilly. It's not quite as hot as Cape Town, I can tell you that. <laughs> <clears throat> yes, um, I'm, I'm going to begin with a very simple question. Um, I remember you posted something about a couple of weeks ago, and you're talking about how you you help your clients raise their sales, increase their sales by one thousand mm percent. -hmm. How do you do that? How do you do that? And for the benefit of those who didn't get the chance to to view. Um, okay. Well, there's <clears throat> first of all, that's a very good, intelligent question. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> The, the simplest, it, it's a bit of a process I go through, um, Trone, uh, but the easiest way I can explain it is to get very, very clear on their brand. And there's, there's many things that go into that equation, but for an example, if I were to hold up, uh, well, here's some lens cleaner, for example, and people will see a logo. Okay, there's a logo here. But a logo is not a brand. And really, really strong brands are, are almost like people. In other words, what, what I do to help people grow their businesses, first of all, is to get extremely clear about what their brand is. Now, to me, a brand is represented by two questions. First question is, is what, what do you stand for? Because you have to think of a brand as a person. And if that person, if that brand was a person, what kind of characteristics would that brand have? In other words, what kind of morals would it have? What kind of values would it have? What kind of ethics would it have? Because people buy from brands that they can really identify with. So in other words, the customers see themselves in that brand and say, you know what? I really like what this brand uh, stands for. So it all begins with those kind of uh, uh, um, those kinds of questions and getting very, very clear and writing almost what I call a manifesto around that. Now, uh, the difference between a manifesto and a mission statement is companies have mission statements and they all say silly stuff like, we exceed our customers' expectations. And, and I go, that's just a bunch of non nonsense because that's what everyone says. So a manifesto, yeah. a manifesto is kind of like um, your own personal Ten Commandments, if you will. In other words, this is what I believe in. This is my manifesto. These are my beliefs. These are my creed. And then the next step is to create a very clear understanding with the company, the people who work in your company and in that business, so they understand, here's what my business stands for. This is what I stand for. And um, I can give you an example. One of the most successful coaching students I have is from Johannesburg, actually. Uh, and he wow. has a, um, a, a business that sells rock drill bits. And we were able to grow his business 400% by just by getting very, very clear what he stood for. And so when we put that in the branding to say that we're a very above board business, we're 100% ethical, we don't cut corners. And as soon as we started advertising that very clearly, uh, we just, just completely dominated in the marketplace. So that's uh, kind of a long answer, but that's how we do it. It's getting very, very clear. And it's like being a human being. Um, people want to be your friend if they know who you are and they understand what you stand for. And that's if you want to be a rock star in life and business, you must take a stand. You can't be, you know, wobbling back and forth. Does this make sense to you? It makes sense. Okay. It makes sense. 
Yeah, it really makes sense. Uh, you know, um, my definition of branding is the shaping of perception. And I believe that we, yeah, branding is all about shaping perceptions. In my next book, I talk about it as the, the, the perception game, how you build the perception. Now, right. In your own words, how, how would you build uh, the perception in the mind of the prospect? Okay, that, that's, uh, that's another excellent question. So again, I go right back to, uh, you're asking me some very, we're kind of going deep here. So this is really good. I love this stuff. <laughs> okay. So, okay. Now here's, let me explain it this way. There is what I call internal reality. That means what is your business really like, good, bad, or ugly? Okay. That's internal reality. And then we have, as you say, building a brand is the perception part. So that's external perception. Whenever I work with a coaching client or coaching student, the first thing I want to do is I want to get the internal reality as good as possible. In other words, you really should endeavor to build a better product, a better service. You should always endeavor to be better and always innovate and, and, and increase, you know, increase the quality of what you do. Having said that, the conflict comes when the external perception does not match the internal reality. So some okay. businesses some businesses are really great at branding, so their external perception is very good, but then when the customer buys or uses the service, it kills the brand okay. because these two do not match. Uh, other businesses have a problem when their internal reality is excellent. In other words, the product or service is great, but their external perception is terrible. So in the case of uh, my friend, Mr. Martins from uh, Johannesburg with his company, his internal reality was fantastic. He had a great product. He just didn't know how to present that to the public. So we got very, very clear to do this. Now, what I did, and this is what I believe is the best. If your outside perception matches your internal reality, in other words, there's a great congruence there, then your, your perception is going to kill it in the marketplace. Because if there's one thing people love today, it's authenticity. So if you can, if you can genuinely represent how great you are, and by, and by the way, you don't have to be the best. You just have to be honest in your perception. And, and I'll give you an example of this. Um, there is an, uh, there's an airline from Ireland called Ryanair, and everybody knows it's like a terrible airline, so their internal reality really isn't that good, but everybody knows they're a terrible airline. Everybody complains about it, and everybody jokes about it, but that's their yeah. brand perception, and they actually stick to it. And because they're mm. honest about it, they get tons of business. <laughs> 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 so wow. that's 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 you know, the key is is just like I said you can be good bad or ugly in business as long as you're honest if if you're lousy and you know it and you admit it and you wear it almost like a badge of honor people will still buy from you because they'll go okay you know not every company has to be Rolls Royce you really don't have to be it's when you pretend to be Rolls Royce and you're not that's where the problems start. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Wow, that's very that's very profound. You know, uh, most people position position themselves as something they're not. You know, I find this very common with 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 a lot of people, and I call it the "fake it till you make it" syndrome, where people yeah. believe that you know I can just fake it till I make it. And how, uh, how would you how would you advise somebody who's starting uh, so that they can position position themselves in a way that is appealing to the to, to the people. Okay. So it, it depends on their, um, it depends on their business, obviously. Um, I think what is more important instead of faking it till you make it is to, as, as uh, professor Amy Cuddy says from Harvard university, she says, you should act as if until you become. So from a, just from a personal stand, I'm going to talk personal coaching here, personal transformation. As an individual, you always want to um, increase the quality of the character of you, okay? Uh, per, for example, I, I, I want to call you Dr. T almost. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Dr. T. 
Because you almost look like a Dr. T when we talk. I love that. Um, but uh, all, joke, all joking aside, you've probably heard this expression that uh, people don't buy your product, they buy you. Have you heard that expression before? Yes, that is true. That is true. Okay. Okay. So my question, when I, when I get people to agree to that statement, my question to them is, if that's true, how good is the quality of this product? That's the first thing I want to know. If people really buy you, then how good is this? How good is the mind, the body, the soul? How good is the character? So if you don't have all the character traits of a high-performing, high-quality individual, then you should act as if until you acquire them. That's that's step number one. Okay. Um, now where was we? I lost my I lost my train of thought. <laughs> that's the first part of the question. You can tell yeah. I need more coffee yet. Here, so. <laughs> Yes. Uh, so just quickly repeat the first question. Forgive me. Okay. So the first question was: I give an example of people that position themselves as something they are not. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So here's the first. And, yeah. You can go ahead. Uh, the first stage to that. Well, I'll give you an example as as uh, particular particularly if people want to be coaches and things like this. Because um, a lot of people, I see a lot of that happening in the coaching industry. They position themselves like they're better than they are. And that's simply not necessary. The one thing I learned, and you, you probably can't see it back there. This is, this is my home office. I have, this is my wall of fame. I have, it's a lot of stuff. But I have a, um, a songwriting award from the second highest Grammy award winner in, in, in the world. And uh, that's something I got years ago. But I learned something from this gentleman that was very profound because I had asked him a question. I said, how did you get so many hit records with so many great artists? And he says, it's a really good question. And the answer is this. He goes, the most important thing is I only work with artists I can create a hit with. And I thought, wow, this is profound. So... I was never a coach until about five years ago. Uh, I was a businessman. I learned how to speak and I built an investment company and then I sold it and kind of retired from that. Um, but what I learned is when I got into coaching, I said, I need to build a track record of success. And now here's the mistake a lot of people make when they go into business. They will, you'll pardon this expression, they'll prostitute themselves to anyone who will give them money. And I don't think that's a strong way to build a business. You have to start a business based on honesty and integrity. And, and those words mean something. So when I first started coaching, I would only coach people that I knew that I knew I could have success with. Because, you see, you can have a great student and a great coach. But the only important thing is, are they great together? And not, um, not every customer is meant for you. So I started off very slowly, and I would pick and choose my clients very carefully. And that's why I have this wall of fame today, because <laughs> I, I, made it very, I made it very easy for me to win. I would only work with people that I – listen, uh, I mean, apparently I'm pretty good at this. That's the rumor. Um, you are. <laughs> But that does not mean I'm the right coach for you specifically. And it has nothing to do with anything except that are we a good match? That's the only question that matters. So in business, you want to build your reputation. And I, for example, I have uh, two young gentlemen who live very close here by. They are building contractors. And, you know, they do home renovations. And when I got them to think like this, I said, listen, your job is to only do jobs that you can do in an excellent fashion. I don't want you taking money just because you think you maybe sort of can get away with it. And they in Canada, I, I know you guys are in South African Rand, so it's about a 10 to 1 difference, let's say. So they were doing their average job would be, if I convert in uh, two years ago, was 250,000 Rand for a renovation. Today okay. their average job is uh, would be 4 to 5 million Rand. A renovation. Wow. And the wow. way we did that, we, the way we did that is we said, we will no longer take money just because we're not going to fake it till we make it. 
We're going to do smaller jobs. We're going to do them in an excellent fashion. We're going to build a reputation for excellence because that's our brand. We will never take money unless we can really, really do well. And what turned things around is when they were approached by their first customer to do a renovation for one million rand, and I told them to turn it down because they knew they couldn't do the job. They didn't have the capability. And when they told the customer, at first the customer was very angry, but then he came back and said, I really want to do business with you now because I know you're honest. So the customer increased the contract by another 50% immediately. Wow. And that, wow. my friend, is how you build a legitimate, honest clientele. Start small. If you're small, it's okay. Just tell people the truth. It's a miraculous business formula. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that, that is very impressive. You know, um, I've, I've sat down with quite a lot of people and we always have this conversation where people ask me, what's the return on investment uh, of building a brand or developing a brand? And most people don't want, uh, most people are so comfortable with being transactors, they don't want to build a, ba uh, a brand. You know, in your, in your own, how would you, how would you measure, how would you measure uh, the success of a brand to, to actually say that this brand is successful? Is it through sales? Is it through loyalty? How would you measure it? Well, to, it, it's, it's all of those things because to me, loyalty means repeat business. It's repeat business. Because if, and, it, and it, all of this goes down to sustainability. So your previous question, Dr. T, <laughs> was uh, was very relevant because here's the thing: if you if you're if you're faking it till you make it, that means you have zero authenticity, and you are not sustainable because people will find out very quick. I mean, this is the internet; we're we're literally thousands of kilometers apart, and yet here we are connecting together today, which is just. I mean, it's, it's incredible. I love this technology from this standpoint. So yeah. building sustainability, how do you measure the rate of return, return on investment is do we have an increase in sales? Do we have an increase in customers? Do we have greater longevity, for example? I can give you, I can't tell you the business. It's actually in Cape Town, South Africa. It's one of my coaching students I helped out with. It's a restaurant and bar. And I can tell you that one, once we got the branding dialed in, not only did the sales increase by 77% in seven weeks, uh, the amount of regular customers doubled, literally doubled. So we had customers, the customers, the, the existing customers started coming back two weeks earlier than previously before because we created a better brand, a better customer experience, and we doubled the amount of regulars in just eight weeks. That's a great brand because it's sustainable. People are coming back because they want to be there. Wow, this is amazing. You know, <laughs> um, many, many, many businesses struggle with with staying consistent in, mm -hmm. in, in their offering, staying co consistent. I mean, what advice would you give to uh, somebody who's struggling with being consistent and how to ensure consistency in in everything that you're doing in your business? Well, the, the number one rule uh, of all of that is measurement. Measurement. Okay. And, and you have to, when I say measurement, we have to take a look at the gap between where we are now and where we wish to be. And when I say where we are now, we have to make a brutal, and I mean brutal assessment. We have to be ruthless with ourselves and not tell ourselves stories, not make up, oh, excuses, or, or as a great coach that I know here in America says, stop giving me reasons why you're not, excuse you know, well, the reason we're not succeeding is this, or the reason we have this problem is this. That's all nonsense. It's stories we tell ourselves. So until we get, you know, look in the mirror, so to speak, and become absolutely ruthless and say, here is where we're at. For example, and, and you know, people face this in health and fitness. Well, you know, I look okay. Well, wh how much do you weigh then? And what's your specific target? So how much do you weigh now? And be ruthless. And, and, and with your diet, are you, really, are you really eating healthy or are you fooling yourself 
thinking that maybe because you had a green smoothie six weeks ago that you're doing something. But when you actually begin to, uh, if I take my pad of paper, for example, when you ex actually begin to document what you ate that day, how much sleep you got, how much exercise you did, and then start to plan and don't make a to-do list, you need to schedule in or schedule in, depending how we say it, into your mm -hmm. calendar these tasks. See, everybody makes the mistake of a to-do list. Successful people yeah. don't make to-do lists. They schedule in, eat healthy, get exercise, da -da 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 -da. It's measurement because if nothing is measured, you cannot make progress. And you have to be ruthless until this gap is finally closed. Wow. That is, that, that is so true. You know, um, I, I believe that people don't care. Uh, people don't care what you do for them. Uh, they, they really love how you make them feel and they will remember how you make them feel. Yes, right. yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes, and how you make them feel. And the same goes if you if you're, if you're to use a, 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 a PC, the feeling is different as compared to a, a window, I mean, I mean um, an Apple product. Sure. The feeling yep. is totally different. Mm -hmm. And how, how, how do I make my products or anything that I'm selling to have a different feeling um, that will connect with my customers uh, emotionally okay another amazing question <laughs> I, I i have to tell you i am i'm really impressed because i usually don't get questions this great and uh and i'm not saying that to flatter you but i mean that as a sincere uh, observation as a very good observation okay so um it all comes back to what does your brand stand for? And you used Apple, so I'm going to give you that exact example. Uh, first of all, what you said about how making people feel is the most important thing. If you want to dominate, if you really want to dominate, you have to master the art of creating feelings about your brand. People will pay more money for feelings than anything else in the world. If you don't believe me, why do they go to sporting matches? Why do they go to concerts? Why do they do what they do for work? Why do they go to a movie or read a book, et cetera, et cetera? Now, it all starts with your brand. So, for example, you use Apple. A lot of people think Apple's brand is the Apple logo, you know, where you have the – I've got one on my mouse because I use Mac products. Uh, what, wow. Steve, what Steve Jobs said very clearly many years ago, here's Apple's brand. Number one, number one. We create the best consumer products with the best user experience. Key word, user experience. Number two, our brand is where we refuse to compromise, and this is an important part, we will never cheapen our product's quality just to get a lower price. So they'll never, quote, unquote, prostitute themselves just to sell lower. So if you want a less expensive product, go someplace else. So they were very, very clear on their brand. Now, the user experience, Apple does everything they can. When you go to their website, it looks a certain way. When you walk into an Apple store, if you've been to one, it has a certain look and feel to it. When you buy Apple products, even the feeling of the packaging, and people are insane. There's people on YouTube that actually videotape the unboxing you know why? Because Apple has been clever enough to understand that the unboxing, the reveal, the magician going, voila, is, <laughs> is all part of that experience. And I will tell you, and again, I can't mention the firm, but there is a law office in Cape Town where when you walked in their door, you did not have a good customer feeling because it was dingy and they had horrible coffee and lousy furniture and it kind of smelled in there. So, but when they invited you into the lawyer's boardroom, well, that was fancy, you know, big fancy table and leather chairs and beautiful lighting. And the first thing we assessed was, okay, wait a second. What does the customer think? I get to sit in this horrible room, but you lawyers get to have it nice, which means that I'm paying you all this money for you to live in luxury and you treat me like garbage. That's how people feel. So long story short, and I can't tell you what we did because this is private, obviously, but if you use your imagination, you see, you 
and, and whoever's watching this today, if you tap into your creative imagination and ask yourself simply, if I was the customer here, what kind of experience would I want to have? I mean, how many times have you walked into a restaurant or a business and they didn't even smile at you? I can tell yeah. you that a, a smile alone will increase revenue. Teaching your staff to smile will get you more sales. I guarantee you. And I know that because I've done it dozens of times all over the world. I mean, I've now spoken in 75 cities all over the world. So uh, the one thing that's universal is this. A smile is universal. So if you think think of how can you create an incredible customer experience. And, and you can, even with rock drill bits, we were able to build in exciting moments because we started putting prizes in the boxes. So when the customer would open up a box, and these are drill bits, this is boring stuff. <laughs> but the customer opened up the box and there was a prize inside. And that made, wow. wow, you know, and it's not expensive. It doesn't have to be expensive. It just has to be a surprise. So if you can think of, you know, uh, just like, how can I, I used to shop at a menswear shop locally. The first wow that I got was when I walked in in the morning and the gentleman at the menswear shop said, good morning, sir. He didn't jump all over me to sell suits and ties. He said, good morning, mm -hmm. sir. May I get you a, a, a cappuccino or a latte while you're looking around? And I said, um, sure, okay, how much? He said, <clears throat> I beg your pardon. He said, no, that's no charge. He goes, it's, it's on the house. Please feel free to relax and enjoy yourself. I'll get it ready for you. I have a machine right back here. And I went, okay, this is different. So it was just that little thing, you know, he didn't, and he served me really good coffee, not cheap, you know. <laughs> so, okay, so just, I, I'm not gonna go on, but that's the idea. Just think creatively in your imagination. If you're an entrepreneur, use your creative muscles and say, how can I make this a lot of fun? Like if, if it was cool, what would I do? And I can't tell you how many, there's a cooking school I worked with out in Stellenbosch, we created the coolest culinary school in the world by using those ideas. Wow. You know, I, I don't know who said this, but somebody said that you know, a, a smile is so powerful, it can even break ice. You know, you meet somebody for the first time, a smile can actually uh, break ice. Um, you know, when, when you look at um, companies like Apple, if you go to Apple, you know, a person who works at Apple, their name tag says genius. You know, it makes you feel like uh, you're being saved by somebody who, who, who knows what they're doing. And the same goes for if you go to Disney, it's, it's, it doesn't say, you know, janitor. It says, you know, cast because everything is a show. Uh, what's the, 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 the coalition between um, a, a brand and um, corporate culture? How do we incorporate it together? And how do we um, utilize brand culture to actually uh, gain brand awareness? Okay, so you're talking about creating the culture inside to, to amplify the brand or enhance it. Am yeah. I right? Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. Another great question. <clears throat> There's something, and this goes back to having a, a manifesto. There is a, um, an organization, and you, you know, anybody who's watching can look this up in the United States. It's an exercise uh, company called Soul Cycle. And if you if you look online and see Soul Cycle Manifesto, you can type that in. It's it's kind of their belief system. Now, how does this work? Uh, Soul Cycle is an exercise class where people get on their stationary bikes and they ride and sweat. Now, I don't find that particularly inspiring. <laughs> okay. Um, having said that. There are, as you know, lots of gyms, lots of fitness places all over the world, and, and they're all competing with each other, and nothing's different. So what makes Soul Cycle different? I mean, they have instructors, they have, you know, cycle bikes, which anybody can buy. So how do we, how do we differentiate a fitness center? Well, the way you do it is the way which I've done with many businesses is, number one, is something I call recognizing global purpose. And what that means is seeing what you do in much bigger terms. In other words, how are you going to change the world? And to go back to Steve Jobs, he said, we don't build computers. We're here to put a dent in the universe. Well, 
it's still a computer company, but it's a lot more inspiring to put a dent in the universe and, and make mm. a difference in people's lives. Okay. <clears throat> so, for example, um, one of the one of the uh, people I worked with, I said, "What do you do for a living?" And the owner of the business says, "We teach kids to cook." And I go, "Well, that's not inspiring because anybody can do that." Wow. And I said, so I asked this lady, I said, when you're, when your kid and the, the students are 18 to 20 years, 22 years old. Okay. They love to cook great, but that's not inspiring. That's not enough. So I said, when your students leave your school, where do they go? And she said, well, they go all over the world. And I said, okay, so here's, here's something I have a question for you. You teach kids to cook. That's <laughs> like boring. Okay. <laughs> So when I said, I said, take a look at what you do. I said, number one question. And you and I, I'm in Canada. You're in uh, South mm. Africa right now. Here's, a, I mm. have a question for you, Dr. T. How important mm. is food to life? Very important. I have it every day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> food, food is life. I mean, it is yeah. literally life. And here's another question. What do we do when we get together to make friends? We break bread, so to speak. So yes. food is, is part of our culture. It's part of every culture, and every culture has their own food and their own rituals. I mean, the Italians have Italian food and da-da-da, so on and so forth. And, and as you know, like I have a nice home, but if I invite people over, nobody goes to the living room. Everybody sits in the kitchen because the mm. kitchen is the heart of the home. So I said to this lady, I said, you have to recognize that food is life, and it's a big deal. And, and food made with love, there's a big difference to that. I mean, food made with love and care has a big effect. And I said, think about what you're doing. These people, these students are going to go out and serve food, and people will be building businesses over this food, relationships, friendships, marriages, family, maybe the next Microsoft or uh, Google, who knows? That we, mm. Food is so important that we even serve it at funerals to comfort ourselves. So you um, don't just teach kids to cook. You're feeding the world because your students are going all wow. over the world. And she went, oh my gosh, I never thought of it that way. So wow. to get your point across, once she recognized what she was doing, she could say to the students and indeed the staff, we don't teach kids to cook. We feed the world here. And that immediately changed the culture because everybody said, wow, my life has purpose greater than just washing some pots and pans. We're, we make a real difference in the world. And so to answer your question is to have a very clear manifesto of what you're doing and then communicating that clearly to everyone in the company. And third, most importantly, is to make sure that everybody's individual God-given talents and gifts are connected so they're doing the right job in the company and they can see how their God-given gifts connect to the right job, which drives the global purpose so that everyone can see that they're important, right down to the guy sweeping the floor because everyone is important. Wow. Feeding the world, wow. Yeah. Wow, That 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 is amazing. If, even if I am somebody who is looking into using a services and I see that, and she tells me that she's feeding the world, it's, it appeals to me um, more than just teaching kids how to cook. This is that's, really amazing. That's right. And, and see, that all goes, this is the heart of the brand. That's, see, the reason you can relate to that, Dr. T, is because that is a value. That is a value. You just said it yourself, got here one minute ago. I like these guys because they believe in what I believe in. I believe in that. I want to support that brand. That's how wow. you create an amazing brand. It's what you stand wow. for. This is what we're doing here. And, and, and everybody has greatness in them, but it takes, it takes forward thinking, you know, because people, today life, people come along, don't, you know, who do you think you are? And it's like, you mm. have to know who you are and recognize that your business is there for a mighty purpose, a mighty purpose. And I, I did this with a business in Johannesburg, 4,000 employees. They were asking how to grow. I said, you have to realize that what you do 
gives life to people. They provide employment. I said, do you realize how important that is? They have no clue. But once everybody got it, that company grew 292% in 18 months. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I, I'm, I'm going to flip over um, just a bit and ask you, can the people you surround yourself with add value to your brand? Uh, hmm. If they support what you believe in, yes. Yeah. Okay. So in the very same way, um, you know, companies use endorsements uh, like mm -hmm. Nike with Michael Jordan. Uh, is that what you're talking about? Um, well, not so much that because in a paid endorsement, celebrities, it's a little bit different. Some of them will do anything for money. I mean, you know, yeah. but, but having said that, celebrities do – the interesting thing about celebrities is this. Um, I'm helping some local people here. They want to – they have a local business, and they want to uh, do a giving back program. So they are going to build a special fitness facility that is only <clears> – I <throat> beg your pardon – that is only designed and specially made for first responders. Uh, like doctors, surgeons, ambulance workers, uh, police f firemen, because they undergo a particular type of stress that is, you know, we can't appreciate un unless you work there. <clears throat> so it's kind of a safe space for them, and it's only those types of people. And so we're going to get a celebrity, uh, an Olympic gold medalist here in Canada, because that's where we are, um, and I asked him, I said, would you be willing, be willing to come out and endorse this? And I said, before you say anything, let me explain what we're doing. And here's the mission and here's the manifesto. And he says, I'm in. And like, well, how much money do you want? He goes, I don't want any money. This exactly represents what I stand for. So see, when you, when you lead with those values and, and listen, if the company is good, like Michael Jordan with Nike, he's, he's in a way he has to protect his brand too, because he's being paid. He wants to make sure that their values are in line with his. And in this case, to answer specifically, Nike's specific branding is this. We celebrate great athletes and we mm. celebrate great athletics. And so I'm sure Michael Jordan feels very strongly about that. <laughs> <laughs> that is very true. Um, personal question, which brand would you miss if it disappeared? Let's say... I don't know, something happens and that brand just disappears. Which brand would you miss and why? Uh, boy, that's I can tell you which brand I would, I would, I would, I would miss. Personally, I have two at the moment, okay. uh, which is Harley. Harley, Harley uh, Davidson? I would to yes, I would totally drive a Harley if I weren't scared of bikes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Harley and um, obviously Google because she knows everything. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, Google. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, yeah. For me, it would be uh, Fender guitars. Yeah, because wow. I'm, I'm, a, I, yeah, I'm a musician. Uh, yeah, I, I have, uh, well, there's one sitting here, as a matter of fact. I have, uh, I won't pick it up and play right now. I could, but, you know, here it is. Here you, go. you can just show me. Yeah, <laughs> there's a Fender guitar. One. Well, this is a Strat, and this this is actually I had this custom made, so a little little bit different. Wow. But um, um, I've got about five guitars in this very office, and another one, another one sitting there. There's two on the walls right now. So, wow. Um, wow. <clears throat> yeah, it would have to be Fender because, uh, and that's just a personal thing. I've been a musician since I was a young boy, and I love the Fender sound. Uh, and I can recognize the sound of a Stratocaster, this particular guitar, anywhere. I, I just know that sound. And I just love that sound. And only a Stratocaster can sound like a Stratocaster. And it's just, it's, um, it's the way the, the woods they use and the design and all these different things. A, a Gibson, for example, they're great mm. guitars. I'm not a fan of Gibsons. I just love that Stratocaster. So it, it, and here's the interesting thing. What you're really asking me is what feeling would I miss? Yes. See? Because that's a yes. feeling. And if once you understand that brands create feelings in people, 
it's that feeling that they're really missed because every person um, buys stuff. There's always an underlying feeling, always. Mm. And I don't care if people say, well, I, I, I bought a Volvo because it's practical and intelligent. Well, that's because you want the feeling of being practical and intelligent. It's still a feeling. So, mm. yeah. Wow. And what happened, what happened to uh, Les, the musician? Why did, you, did you, why did you not take the path of becoming a musician? Why did you um, decide to do business? Okay, well, that's another good question. I, like a lot of young people growing up, wanted to be a rock star, you know. <laughs> and I, I had I had posters of rock stars, you know, in my bedroom wall, and I still do, except now I'm in the pictures with a lot of them, so that's kind of cool. Um, <clears throat> but what, what I didn't know when I was very young, like eight, eight or nine years old, what I didn't know, and my parents couldn't possibly know because they weren't musicians, is that to become a rock star takes incredible dedication and a lot of practice, more practice than you can imagine. Uh, if you want to start, you have to start when you're eight years old like I am, but instead of practicing an hour a day, you have to start with four to five hours a day and eventually get up to eight or nine hours a day of practice. And then by the time you're 24, 25, you'll have put in you know, 15, 16, 17,000 hours of practice and you'll be ready to be a rock star. But it's even more than that. It's uh, not only do you have to be musically proficient, you have to be incredibly mentally tough because that business is one of the hardest in the world to succeed at. You have to undergo incredible discouragement. It takes a long time to learn how to write music, how to become a performer, how to handle the fame. There's so many things to it. And uh, I, just, I just didn't have a clue. And so <clears throat> I was a singer in my 20s, and unfortunately, because I didn't have a vocal coach, I actually damaged my vocal cords so badly, I had to get out of music entirely. And that was another blessing, though, because it led me down a different path of knowledge. And I got so into reading and studying about business and success and all the things that we're talking about that I ended up becoming a different kind of rock star in this world. And I, I don't call myself by that, by the way. That was a title that's been given to me by people all over the world. They call me the legend and amazing yeah. lesson, all this stuff. I, I don't call myself that. That's what people say about me. Yeah. So I just, I just want to make that clear that I didn't give myself that title. So. <laughs> wow. And, and I, I can totally relate to that because I, I, I play bass. So when you're talking about Fender, I know Fender in, uh, for bass guitar is mostly a jazz bass guitar. Yeah. And these Fender, yes. So I, I can totally relate to that. It's a decision that I had to make as well, uh, which path I, I wanted to take. And I, would, I tell people that business chose me. Uh, it, I did not, yeah. yeah, I did not choose that by myself. But um, let, me, let me move on to the next question. And yeah, so I'm gonna ask you, in, you know, I've, I've heard you speak, I don't know, more than six times. And each time you come on stage, you come with so much energy. You you come and you deliver, and you every time you 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 spoken, you, you you transform lives. Every time you speak, you know you're always funny. How 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 did you get to that? Is it practice? Is it how how did you get to that? Um, hmm. boy, you're asking me really good questions. <laughs> <laughs> so are you are you asking me how how do I, how do I do that basically? Yes. yes. Okay. Okay. Um, it's it's actually more simple than you would imagine. Um, first of all, I, there's a lot of people, and maybe this will go to people who want to be speakers out there or who are doing speaking like you are. My, my, my approach and my approach to an audience is very different from most speakers. Now, a lot of people want to be a speaker because they just love the attention and and who doesn't like to be you know who doesn't want applause and, and attention yeah you know because it, it feels good to get attention but i don't do what i do for attention i could care less about that stuff my focus is very very different <clears throat> for example if i have a bunch of awards and achievement and i do i have all that stuff in my office here but I don't show people that. You'll never see this office posted online because this is my my personal man cave here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> but it, but but my achievements are nothing. They're meaningless to you in the audience unless I use them to help you. So I put all all of my focus is on the audience, and I get my energy from the audience. That's where it comes from. But I learned something is that uh, many years ago when I played in a band, for example, my bandmates would say, oh, I wonder if it's going to be a good crowd today or if it's going to be a lousy crowd, like a good audience versus a lousy audience. There's no such thing as a lousy audience. There's only a lousy speaker or a lousy band. That's it. Because the audience acts as one organism. It is my job. If they're, And I've seen this with my fellow speakers and coaches. We'll be talking and they'll say, gee, that was a tough crowd today. And I go, let me at them. Just let me at them. I can't wait. <laughs> because, because I know I, their, their attitude is wrong. My job is to serve the audience. And so I will take, and here's the thing, you may, may have heard this expression, because a lot of people talk about the, um, uh, oh, what is it, the uh, manifesting. And, you know, you know, you give what you, uh, you receive what you give, and et cetera, et cetera. Here's the trouble. If you give a lot, you get, you, you, the thing is with receiving from the universe is very simple. First, you have to give, then you receive. In other words, first we put the wood in the fireplace and then we get the fire. But there's a trick to that. As a speaker, you can't hold back anything. And that's where speakers make a mistake. They're always holding something back. When I work with the person, whether it's one-on-one -on -one coaching or if I'm in front of 3,000 people, I, I cut loose. I give it everything I have, heart and soul, everything. I'm not afraid if I get upset set on stage and I get teary-eyed and I start actually crying, so to speak. I don't do that on purpose. It's not an act. But if I'm getting worked up emotionally, because my purpose is to connect with you in the audience. That's the only thing I care about is, is, is what I'm saying to you. Is any of my teaching or if I'm inspiring you, to me, insp inspiration is not enough. You have to be inspired and you must have tools. So I will do anything, anything to connect with my audience. Because if I use these two hands to lift up 100 people and I give everything I have to lift 100 people, I will now have 200 hands lifting me up. And that's how you become the big star on stage. It's not by lifting yourself up. It's not making yourself great. It is making your audience great. And that is the only thing I care about as a speaker. That's it. I don't care. You know, it's funny. This weekend I spoke in Charlotte, uh, United States. I spoke to 100 people, and I did what I do because this is just my focus. And and if, for those of you who like the fame part of it, I got absolutely mobbed for pictures, and people hug you, and they kiss you, and they cry, and and it's it's an incredible. But this is this is merely uh, this is merely to me a reflection that I did the right thing. Uh, I don't look for that stuff. I, I appreciate it, and I very much respect it, and I'm very, very humbled by that. But my job is to help you, period, end of story. If I do that, well, then you want to call me the rock star, that's fine. I'll take that. <laughs> you know, I always share this joke with people, and I've told you this joke before. Uh, I became a speaker because of you, and I always tell people that um, on stage that, you know what, I became a speaker, I had less Evan speak, so if I suck, please blame this guy. He motivated me to become a speaker. <laughs> thanks, thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> no, but obviously uh, people don't, people actually appreciate um, everything. But my, my, my next question is, how, which, what advice would you give to speakers out there? Should they go out and look for speaking engagement or should they spend time on developing themselves to become great, then people will invite them. How would you advise them? Okay. That's another really good question. The simple truth of it is the more, the more you speak, the better you get. And so sitting around trying to prepare to be great doesn't work. It's my son. My son is a filmmaker, for example, here in Canada. And we years ago when he was wanting to we had a suggestion well he should go to university or film school 
And so we asked a very successful film director here, uh, what do you recommend? Should he go to film school or, or what? And this, this gentleman, he's a Canadian director. His name is David Cronenberg, but he's been very, very successful all over the world. He said, the only, he goes, don't send your son to film school if he wants to be a film director. He said, the only way you can become a filmmaker is to make movies. That's it. And at first, okay, so the first thing, when you first start speaking, you're not going to be very good. You know, you have, before you can be phenomenal, you have to be great. And before you can be great, you have to be good. And before good comes okay. And before okay comes, you really suck. So, <laughs> but, but, but the thing is, if you persist at it and you learn, like every time I speak, I make a mental note and say, did that connect? Did that work? No, that didn't work. This didn't work. And to not get, I'm very uh, emotionally dispassionate about the business of speaking. In other words, I, I don't get attached to the result. I'm only observing the result. Well, that didn't work. That didn't work. If I tell a joke and it didn't work, bah, big deal. I make fun of myself. <laughs> I, I, I really do. I mean, the, the, actually, the funniest thing I ever say to people is when they don't laugh, I say, like, come on, laugh. That was funny. And then they laugh. <laughs> You know, and in, and in fact, this weekend, one gentleman said, he goes, you know what? I'm funnier than you because the crowd laughed at my joke about you instead of you. And I said, you're right. But and because because I had admitted it, everybody laughed. See, it, it's again, that's being authentic on stage. I, I don't care. I just don't care. I, my, I don't care. So you have to stop worrying about yourself. That's being selfish. Mm -hmm. This is a. A, a thing I get from people all the time, they say, I'm worried at how I'm going to come off on stage. And I go, good. I hope you fail because you're, <laughs> because you're being selfish. It's like mm. it, it, your job is to save the audience, serve the audience. So you shouldn't be worrying about what, how you're coming off. You should be worried about how you're connecting with somebody. I and mean, let's face it, if you, if you were in the street today, and you saw somebody got hit by an automobile. I mean, our first instinct is to run over and, and help somebody, not to worry about how we're going to look while we're doing it. Mm. You know, so you don't go, oh, my gosh, there's a camera crew. I better hold on before. I know you're bleeding to death. I know yeah. you're bleeding to death. But just hang yeah. on. I got to, Can we get makeup over here? You know, <laughs> so that's not my job. I mean, I, yeah, I want to look good on stage, presentable, etc. But my mm. job is to worry about you. Not me. I don't care. I don't care what you think of me because I know I can help you. That's my job. And if and if I do my very best and if I really connect with you, you're going to feel it and you're going to know it. You're going to go, this guy actually cares. So, Wow. Wow. This is very true. You know, uh, a man once said that the success of a man is not valued at uh, by the amount of money he makes, but it, it is valued by the, the number of people that he he helps and he develops, you know. Yeah. And in, 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 in my, you are a very successful man because when you look at all the people that are, are, are becoming speakers or are becoming uh, successful entrepreneurs because of your contribution to this world. And personally, I just want to say I really appreciate that. And, you know, Johnson A say that the new kind of billionaire is not the one who owns a billion dollars or, you know, has a lot of money but the person who impacts a billion people. And I can safely and boldly say that you have impacted more than a billion people and we really appreciate that. You know, my... <laughs> I, can't, I, I can't even... I don't even know how to, uh, how to process that, but thank you. <laughs> yes, uh, you're welcome. So, um, in closing, what advice would you give to anybody, any entrepreneur out there? Uh, what would you say to them in closing? Um, okay, the biggest, probably the best piece of advice I could give you is this, to anyone who's listening, is don't make the mistake of focusing on X amount of money. Now, that's okay, but I just want to, I'm going to clarify this for just a second. Focus on what do you want your life to look like? Not necessarily what do I want to do or how much money I want to make. 
visually, a mental picture in your mind's eye, what do I want my wife to look like? And then once you find out what you want it to look like and be very clear about what you want, because most human beings, and, and I ran into this yesterday. There was an Asian lady yesterday. She's like, I, 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 you know, I'm not sure what I want. And I go, yeah, that's a very common problem. I mean, here we are grown adults and we don't know what we want. And she says, well, I can't figure out which one I like, what lifestyle I want, because I want this, but then I want this. I mean, I'm sure this sounds familiar, right? She's nice. like, so how can you tell me how to do that? And I said, well, let me tell you a couple things. First of all, if you get clear about the life you want, then you just need to figure out how much do I need to sustain that life? And the dollar equation becomes much more clear. Because if you set a goal, an arbitrary goal, let's say of $100 million, there's no context. There's no meaning because you can't relate to $100 million unless you have it. And even wow. then, you're like, you. the lifestyle you may want may not need $100 million because mm. there, are, there are other things to like. Relationships are important. Family is important. Your health is important. Spirit is important. All those things are factored in. So once you get clear of what you want your life to look like, you, you may not even need $10 million. Maybe Maybe you need only X amount of dollars a month. And I, I know I learned this through great experience. Uh, working with a doctor's organization because we did financial planning for 28,000 doctors. And that's what we told them. I said, forget about how much money you want. Tell me what you want your life to look like. So that's part one. Part two is this. If you don't know what you want your, in your life is to come up with, say, three or four or five dream life scenarios, which is the challenge this young lady had yesterday or the day before, sorry. And she goes, I said, okay, come up with five Five ideal lives. She goes, yeah, but how do I decide which one to choose? And I go, it's very simple. I'm going to start taking them away one at a time. So you've got five, and I'm going to put the proverbial gun to your head. Yeah. Not really, of course. Okay, mm -hmm. you, I'm taking one away. Here we go. Which one can you live without? Boom. Now you've got four. Let's try that again. Gun to the head. Which life can you live without? Boom. Now we've got three. Which life can you live without? Boom. And then which, now we're down to two, which life can you absolutely, it's going to kill you to lose this life. That's the one you want. Does that make sense? It's it the very, it's the same way you said, what's the brand you can't, it's not, oh, I don't want that brand. It's which one don't I want to lose? Mm. So which ideal life did I paint? You know, one of the greatest blessings in my life is my wife. And it was... I, when I met her, and she's a picture of her up here somewhere, there she is up there. <laughs> um, it wasn't so much that I really wanted her, and I did, believe me. Uh, we've been together for many, many years. But the greatest, even greater motivation, she was the first woman in my life that I couldn't imagine losing. Wow. See, and wow. That's, that's the distinction. So if you want my advice, that would be, the key piece is to find out what is the things in your life, not that you want, rather that you can't stand losing because we are more motivated by the fear of loss than anything. It's like, I don't like people have a fear of poverty. It's like, I don't ever want to go back to that, not ever. So I don't ever want to lose being successful. And that will provide the fire and the inspiration no matter where you are at your life because life is going to throw all sorts of stuff at you. But as you hang on to those things, like, what do I want my life to mean? And it needs pur purpose. Human beings need purpose. Retirement is nonsense. It's nonsense. People who retire are dead within three or four years. It's a fact. It's because the human, the human being, if, you, if your cells do not have purpose, they die. And this cell is part of the human body and meeting the human race. If I lack purpose, I will die too. So work is the most important thing. It's to choose work that defines our lives, that gives us purpose. And the way we get by purpose is to look at the bigger picture, to say, I'm going to feed the world rather than teach kids to cook. And that's my answer to you. Wow. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you uh, taking time out of your very busy schedule. We've tried so many times to have this interview. I don't know for how many months now. <laughs> it's not been 
Yes, and I really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to do this. Thank you very much. I'm sure everybody was really impacted, and we learned a lot. We learned a lot. It, it's uh, absolutely my pleasure, and I was happy to be able to do it. And uh, you caught me at the perfect time because I just finished speaking to all those people this weekend, so I'm still kind of in that mode. <laughs> so. <laughs> I can I can feel that. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for watching. Uh, see you next week. Thank you.